you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Hey, Launch Street, Tamara here. What's up? So this is one of those episodes where it is me talking about some things that I think are important. In fact, based on conversations and questions I've had with and from you. I want to talk today about the mistakes leaders make. In fact, one mistake in particular Um, And before I dive into that, I I have to share with you this conversation I had on the airplane on the way back from Nashville the other day, because it really just highlighted a lot of what we were talking about. Um, I was flying back, and for those of you that know me know, I usually tend to put on very large headphones and not talk to people, but this is one of those rare situations where I got into an interesting conversation with the guy next to me. Turns out he's from a large auto company. I won't say the name. I'll just tell you that he's based in Detroit. And he's a, and he's an executive there. And one of the things he was telling me was how they're really struggling with innovation and not new technology, not this race to self-driving cars, not AI. All that's going incredibly well. He was talking more about innovation inside the four walls of his company by the people who run the business every single day. He was telling me how the people on his team, even though they're doing more operational, marketing, sales, et cetera, you know, all these other departments, uh, maybe not the ones you think about when you think of innovation, but he was telling me how he really needs them to innovate. Um, that, and in fact, that that's where the organization really needs the innovation. And I think we know that. You've heard me say multiple times that innovation isn't just about launching a new product or service. It's about the business being innovative. And I think particularly in today's marketplace, if you look at the companies that are really winning, they're the ones that are looking at how to innovate in their business, not just in the product or service that they put to market. So when he told me that he thought his team couldn't innovate or didn't know how and just was frustrated and a little bit fed up, of course, you can imagine my geek out excitement to talk to him about the Innovation Quotient Edge assessment that we built. We built it exactly for that reason. When people say, I need everybody to innovate, um, but I don't, they don't know how or I don't know what tool to give them, the IQE assessment, for those of you who haven't taken it, is a really powerful tool. It's an online assessment that we have. Just go to our website, go to launchstreet.com, G-O-T-O launchstreet.com, and it tells you your unique innovator archetype, how you innovate naturally. There's nine triggers of innovation. And it's the combination of the top two power triggers, how you innovate best, your wellspring of innovation that you can tap into to bring more of those innovative ideas and solutions mindset to your work and life, which actually, now that I think about it, leads into what I want to talk to you about today, which is that mistake that leaders make. Here's what I think happens. Um, We as leaders are given a mandate, right? We have to build a team of innovative people. We have to, to raise the culture of innovation, whatever language kind of you tend to use. And then we start by being more innovative ourselves. I mean, we're, we're at the front lines of it. So, so we're the ones that we start with. We then go to our team and we expect them to be innovative too. So we put out this mandate to our team. We say, all right, guys, it's time to be innovative. It's time that we, you know, Um, thought outside the box. It's time that we thought differently about the challenges and opportunities in front of us. We're going to build a culture of innovation around us. So we put out this mandate to the team. The team's all excited. You're excited. Innovation's at the forefront. We all think it's possible. But even with all that excitement, you can't then get the team to actually be innovative, to, to think differently about their work, to come up with those innovative solutions to their challenges. It almost feels like they just can't do it. What ends up happening is those efforts fizzle out or they outright fail. And we kind of going back to doing what we've always been doing. But 
is that failure the fault of your team or is it you? Now, I bet if you're sitting there listening to this, you're thinking, well, it's my team. I, I told them to be innovative and they didn't do it. I'd like to flip it. I'd like to suggest it's you as a leader. Now, before you tune out, let me explain. The reason it's our fault is that the mistake that we as the leader are making is that we expect everyone to innovate in the same way. Either it's the way we innovate, right, how we would approach it, or how someone we admire innovates. You know, maybe we expect everyone to be irreverent and fearless like Steve Jobs or wear hoodies like Mark Zuckerberg. I don't know. But we look to them to all do it one way. So all these people on our team, we pigeonhole to one way of doing things. But what's really happening here is we're failing to live up to our innovation goals because we aren't tapping into the natural talents, the natural abilities of ourselves and those around us. Because the thing is, all of us have slightly different talents and abilities, don't we? It's why we hire the people we hire. Hopefully, we're not hiring people who have the same skills that we do. Hopefully, we're hiring people that have different skills that complement ours. And when we do that and we pigeonhole everyone into one way of innovating, it's like going against a tailwind. It drains our energy. It feels hard and exhausting. Right? People want to try. I've, I've seen it over and over again. We try really hard to be innovative in your way, in our leader's way, but it is exhausting and overwhelming. And eventually, you just kind of give up. Imagine how hard it is for your team to innovate in a way that doesn't work for them. Imagine how hard for a second for you how hard it is for you to innovate in a way that doesn't work for you? And then think about your team in the same way. That's why you aren't getting the results you are after. Your team needs the knowledge of how they innovate. They need permission, and I mean real permission to be innovative, and they need to be able to flex their innovation muscles. Now, for today's podcast, I want to tackle the knowledge part. We can't go through all of it in the time we have. I'll get to permission and muscles in later podcasts. Um, I want to tackle the knowledge part because it's fundamental to all of this. Without it, innovation doesn't happen. You can tell people all day long to innovate. You can even give them the best tools out there, like our innovation on demand. But if they don't know how to apply it, it'll never work. In fact, it's just saying that just reminded me of um, a conversation I had a while back where this company called me and said, hey, we're really struggling with innovation and we're really surprised because we invested, I think it was like three or $400,000, which to some of you is a ridiculous amount and for some of you is tiny, but still it's money spent. But they said they invested all this money in a cool online kind of collaboration technology that would allow their people across the globe to collaborate and connect and vote and do all this cool stuff, basically crowdsource innovation, which is cool, by the way. But the problem is nobody was using it. And they didn't understand why, why that didn't open up this you know, flood of innovation. But the challenge is their people didn't have the knowledge or really the permission to innovate. So when you invest all your time in the process of innovation, in the structure of innovation, without giving your people the knowledge first, those efforts, that investment tends to fall short. I see it over and over again. First, you have to empower your people to innovate before you invest in the processes and the tools. And frankly, I find that if you invest in the processes and the structure first, what ultimately happens is what I just talked about and it fails. But if you flip it and you invest in the people first, the right processes and tools will come out of it. You'll invest not only in the right things, but in the things that they're actually going to use. So I bet you are thinking, all right, that's great, Tamara, but how do I empower my people? How do I give them the knowledge? Well, let me answer that for you because I want you to unlock your greatest advantage, your best self and your best team. And that happens when you and your team discover your innovator archetypes. It's kind of like what I was talking about in the beginning with that conversation on the plane ride with that guy from the auto company about his people don't feel like they can innovate, he can't get them to innovate. When people understand their innovator archetypes, meaning how they innovate best, how they innovate naturally, that's where you get them empowered to innovate. They understand what they can bring to the table and they understand how they fit into the innovation process in your organization. Here's the thing about being innovative. Everybody can do it. It's universal. The challenge is so many of us have shoved that talent, that ability of ours 
into a drawer for so long that it's dusty. It's it's clunky. It's it's hard to get <laughs> to get working. It's kind of like we expect to go into this 3 p.m. brainstorm and suddenly expect us to switch it on. It doesn't work that way. What we need to do is think about how do we empower our people to do it every single day. And those skills, those talents, they're inside all of us. So I used to believe that in order to be innovative, you had to, you know, step outside your comfort zone and dare to be feel it, fearless. I'm pretty certain that a motivational speaker somewhere told me that. So basically, I used to make this mistake. I used to think that there was only one way of doing things, one way to innovate. Or I used to think that, you know, innovation wasn't me, but it was, you know, Brenda down the hall with her cool purple glasses and her funky hair or Steve with his always awesome, clever, witty language. That's what I used to believe. But what my 25 years of work and research made me see is that innovation is universal. Being innovative, that talent is inside all of us as humans. We all do it. However, how we innovate is unique to each of us. And that goes to the nine triggers, the nine ways that we innovate that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, I got this lesson the hard way when I was kind of in my early 20s. So I was working in, on Madison Avenue in advertising, and I was an account coordinator, which basically meant I was the lowest of the low on the totem pole. I was lucky to grab coffee and be a fly on a wall in a meeting. That's how it worked when I was moving up the ranks. So I know some of you younger people now are like, what? You put up with that? That's how it was. But I worked for this amazing team. And this team gave me the extremely important job this one year of putting together, organizing, really being responsible for the big creative strategy meeting the big meeting of the year. This was one where the clients were going to come in and everybody that you know worked on the business was going to come in. And, and the most importantly, the creatives were going to come in and we were going to finalize the creative strategy for the year. This is how we started all of our work. This was it. So I got everybody invited, all the clients, anyone that touched the business in any way. I had Jill from accounting, Greg from media, everybody. And Steve. Now, Steve was on a pedestal. Steve was our creative director. And it was really, this meeting was really our chance to sit back and let Steve spew his brilliance all over us. That's really what this was about, is giving Steve the room to shine and tell us, oh, great one, what is our creative genius strategy for the year? So, I get it all together. I'm feeling pretty good. Meeting day comes meeting starts at nine. It's 8.45. Clients start to roll in. Coffee is brewing. Everything is looking good. Nine o'clock. Hmm. Well, creatives are never on time, so it's fine. 9.10. Creatives always like to run late. That's how they roll. People are still talking. It's all good. 9.20. Um, where is Steve? 9.45. Now the client is sitting down. People are starting to get antsy. It's clear we're missing something. My boss is starting to look at me like, did you get this meeting right tomorrow or did you totally bum? I'm thinking my career is over. So I get Steve on the phone. I find him after like 10 minutes. And I say, Steve, what are you doing at home? Today's the big meeting. And he says, oh, I didn't feel like coming in today. So we're going to need to reschedule that. And hangs up on me. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Our creative genius is missing. This is it. Like our, We have no strategy to roll out if Steve is not here to tell us what that creative brilliance is. So I sit down at the table and I say, well, Steve's not joining us. Yeah, and that's it. I know you probably were expecting me to say something else. So are my clients and my bosses. I had nothing. I tried to hide under the table. But you know what? The most interesting thing happened. First, Jill from accounting said, hey, I know I'm not the creative, but I run the numbers and I've been seeing these patterns. And I was thinking of this idea. And then Greg from Media Buy, who buys all the commercials, Airspace, was like, yeah, um, I know I'm not the creative either, but you know, I've been seeing what's happening in the marketplace and where the TV shows are changing. And I was thinking about this idea for you. Slowly but surely, all these people across the table started peppering in their ideas. And in that meeting... Without Steve, we created a strategy that helped them increase sales by 28%. 
that year. This was a food product, by the way. Hard to, hard to drive sales up. And then it isn't really about the sales. The lesson here is everybody is innovative. But we put these other people up on a pedestal. And then when we ask our everyday people, the people running our business to be innovative, we expect them all to do it like Steve. Jill saw patterns. Greg was looking at new opportunities and blank spaces. Everybody innovates differently if they understand how they innovate and then are given the room to do it. Imagine what you could achieve with your team, regardless of their titles or roles or function, team, even the team or department function, if they knew how to bring their best, most innovative selves to work every single day. What could you accomplish if they had their innovator archetypes, if they took the innovation assessment, to, got their archetypes, and then started leveraging that every single day. And then if you really want to be a rock star leader, get them access to innovation on demand, the innovation library, and see as they implement and flex those muscles every day. You know, Steve put me on a quest to better understand how do we innovate? If being innovative is universal, but we all do it differently, what are those differences? And that's what got to the nine triggers of innovation, the nine ways that we innovate. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this podcast going through every single one of them, but let me just highlight what they are so you can kind of hear them and start thinking through what it means to innovate differently. There's collaborative, there's tweaker, there's experiential, there's fluid, there's futuristic, there's imaginative, there's risk taker, instinctual, inquisitive. There are so many different combinations. The way you do it is unique. The way your team does it is unique. Now, we'll put the link in the show notes to all this so you can get access to it. You know, I'll give you one example. Mark, he is a fluid inquisitive, and he's one of our clients. And he works for a team leader who is smart enough to get the assessment for everybody and then get everybody on demand. So they're really rolling in innovation. But when we first took it, and Mark realized he was a fluid inquisitive, which basically means um, the inquisitive side is, you know, he he innovates in the questions, not the answers. He likes to dig and challenge assumptions. And on the fluid side, he's one of those people that's really good at taking mess and stickiness and actually finding the innovation is in, in it. It's not just that he's good at dealing with ambiguity. I think a lot of us have learned that that's kind of part of life and work as it is today. But he can actually take that ambiguity and turn it into innovation. And what we realized as a team, as Mark took this with his team, is that the way they were structured is there were too many barriers on his work. So his innovation was actually hindered. He had too many guardrails that were keeping him from really thriving. He was doing fine. He's an A player, but he wasn't bringing the innovation he could be. So they removed those guardrails for him. And they started putting him on those challenging, sticky projects where they didn't know what to do. He is thriving and his team is thriving because they're putting people in the right place. Kylie is an inquisitive collaborator. She's another one and another team. Um, and interesting about Kylie is, so inquisitive, we kind of talked about, right? They, they dig, they ask, they challenge the jumps in. So you, you know them because they're the ones constantly asking questions, but that's really how they innovate. She had actually stopped asking questions because she felt bad. She felt like she was holding her team back. She constantly had 10 more questions than everybody else. When her team realized this about her, they actually allowed her more room to innovate, to ask those questions, as opposed to trying to shut it down. She used to be seen kind of as poking the bear, maybe challenging authority. People get frustrated with her. But once they realize that this is how she innovates, she has all the room to ask those questions. And you better believe she is uncovering some real opportunities that the team has missed. And they put her in those places where they're going down one path and they need someone to kind of poke and prod and figure out what's missing in their thinking. Um, Shelly is a client of mine from um, Wendy's, you know, the fast food restaurant with the delicious burgers and fries and then some. And, you know, their team was a team that she works with was really struggling. They were siloed. They didn't kind of trust each other to innovate. They didn't kind of respect each other's way of innovating. She had her team take the assessment. And she said what came out of the meeting where they went through the results and, and kind of came together as a team was that they actually understood and we're started to respect the different ways and the different values and, and performance that the other people on the team brought to it versus just assuming that it should all look one way. Because that happens too from team to team, doesn't it? Where we go, well, this is how we and our little team innovate. So everybody else should innovate that way. It doesn't actually work that way. When you can actually recognize other people's difference in how they innovate, 
it gives them room to do it. And it gives you the room to be able to leverage them appropriately. So how about instead of expecting your team to all innovate in the same way, which ultimately fails, if, if we talked about, empower each of them to innovate in their way. What if you thought differently about how your team innovates? I mean, what you really care about is the outcome, right? The solutions they create, the problems that they solve, the products that they invent, the services they bring to market. That's what matters. So what if you helped each of them understand how they innovate and then empower them to use their natural talents instead of trying to shove them into one talent pool? Imagine the possibilities there. I've given you some examples. It's actually fantastic. It's endless. I want to read to you a quote from one of our clients at Aero Electronics, so billion dollar global company. And we did some IQE work with well, one of their internal teams. And this is what a corporate senior executive had actually sent back to me. With the IQE assessment and tomorrow's presentation, I've learned more about myself and innovation style in the first two hours than I have in most day-long presentations. Her experience has opened my eyes and allowed me to truly understand and leverage my innovator archetype. Using the knowledge I've gained, I'm sure I'll be able to grow and add value in my career. That's one person on a team, but you can hear it in what he in his quote, right? And when he emailed me, that he in those in that time, he was able to open up and understand the value that he brings to the team and really leverage that. So if you're the type of leader that believes that investing in your people helps create a high performance team, then here's what I want you to do. Go to our website, go to launchstreet.com. G-O-T-O, launchstreet.com. And I want you to click on training on the top nav bar and then go to team training. All of the information you need for the IQE, for on demand, it's all there. Go get it for your team and watch them unlock their innovation advantage. See how they come together to collaborate, to innovate, to win. It's powerful stuff. And as I said before, it all starts with the knowledge, with the understanding of how you best innovate. So how about we stop making that mistake that so many leaders make to think that innovation happens in one way and start, start empowering our teams to innovate the way that they do best and get to those outcomes you're looking for. All right, Tamara out. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, launchstreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.